afternoon all. It's time for another book review. Alright, today we're doing book eight of nine in the Ali Beckstrom series. This one is Magic Without Mercy. We're almost towards the end, but let's do them in order. So, book eight. We're dealing with the consequences of Bartholomew Ray and the havoc he has wreaked so far. Uh, if you've gotten to this point in the series, you know that Allie has dealt with him in a very dramatic manner. Uh, it was interesting to see her actually use the magically enhanced guns that are basically untraceable. Uh, I'm kind of curious why they waited until book 7 to really bring something like that out. And then in book 8... Well, things kind of change a little bit as to what they do and how they do it. Uh, at this point, they're still trying to figure out how to unpoison magic. They're making some headway with that, thanks to the combined efforts of the Authority, uh, the Hounds, the Mercs, everyone. But it's still going to take a little bit of time to sort everything out and fix things. Uh, this one is starting to culminate with everything, so a lot of the loose ends are starting to tie together. Uh, it's interesting to see how all the various sides of magic users are pulling together to figure things out. People are starting to finally believe that things are not all sunshine and happiness. There are problems and they do need to be fixed. I look forward to the next book so we can actually talk about all of the overarching story plots and like little fiddly bits. But in the meantime, before then, let's do the back cover and first page of book eight so you can get an idea of just where this one goes. We knew as soon as we stepped out on those streets, we were walking blind into a war. All of us were going to bear the pain for the magic we called upon, and I was going to have to bear the pain for carrying a weapon that made me face what I had become, a killer. Ali Beckstrom's talent for tracking spells has put her up against some of the darkest elements in the world of magic, but she has never faced anything like this. Magic itself has been poisoned, and Ali's undead father may have left the only cure in the hands of a madman. Hunted by the Authority, the secret council that enforces magic's laws, Wanted by the police, and unable to use magic, she's got to find the cure before the sickness spreads beyond any power to stop it. But when a dead magic user seeks to destroy the only antidote, Allie and her fellow renegades must stand and fight to defend the innocent and save all magic. Pretty dramatic. Save all of magic. And it's relatively true. Granted, it's primarily within Portland, thanks to the four wells of magic and all that within the city. But still, there's a lot at stake if, at the moment, with magic poisoned, it could potentially spread, wreak all sorts of havoc. So it's very interesting to see how they deal with that and what the consequences of it are. I mean... Bartholomew Ray wreaked a lot of havoc, and it's hard to undo that quickly. So they're really going to have to show just why it's so important to fix this and stop fighting amongst each other. Uh, as you know, the last book left off with them dealing with Ray's death and just how to go about fixing things from there. But let's do the first page and a paragraph or so of this book so you know where it goes from last book's plot. I had a headache. That headache's name was Seamus Flynn. Ali, my love, he said, you're wrong. That got him a quick glare from Zavian, who was sitting cross-legged on the floor in front of the fireplace. Zay dragged a whetstone across the edge of his katana and caught my gaze. Would you like me to make him shut up? Zay asked with a little more excitement than I like to hear. Tarek, who was rummaging through a stack of knives on the shelf, just snorted, Good fucking luck with that. No, it's fine, I said. It's just... You're wrong, Shame said again, flipping off Tarek. I'm telling you, you'd do best with a projectile weapon. You can't use magic anymore, so you'll have to keep a certain distance from the fight. Get in too close, and magic will eat you alive. Then it will eat you dead, just for good measure. Shame was right. 
I couldn't use magic ever since we'd fought Leander and Isabel at the life well and nearly gotten killed, magic has been making me sick. It had only gotten worse the more I used it, and when I tried to use a tracking spell on a veiled, an undead magic user I'd seen step out of a living person, I'd passed out and hit my head on the concrete. Now if I so much as breathed an abracadabra, oops, I was on the floor puking. I had no idea why I was the only one suddenly allergic to magic. Maybe because I was the only possessed person I knew? Maybe because I could literally pull magic up through my body, whereas other people just drew it into the air and directed it into spells? Whatever the reason, it was seriously cramping my style. I don't want a gun, I repeated. Come now, shame coaxed. Look at all the pretty options. Yeah, so Allie really doesn't want to use the magical guns that can't be traced, even though she used them once against Bartholomew Ray, but I mean, that was relatively good reasoning behind it, so you can only fault her so much. But until she can use magic again, you are sort of limited in options. I mean, she probably has the blood blade and the various swords and whatnot from Xavian, but still. It's good to have a ranged option. Even you don't have to use it, but at least have it. But yeah, they have to figure out how to fix the wells and prevent any more poison magic from spreading. Meanwhile, you have the authority getting various orders from Jingo Jingo and all that, which is troublesome. The hounds are playing more of a part now as they need more troops, basically. And there is the ever-present danger of bringing outside forces from the Authority in to complicate things further. Uh, if you haven't read this full series, of course, as the previous episodes I've said, buy the whole series, read the whole series, and enjoy. But the final book really wraps things up. It shows how things can be fixed, how they will be fixed, and what the consequences are, and who is left standing. This one had a lot of people die, this book. And of course in this series that doesn't necessarily mean much, I mean, very few people seem to stay dead, but there are a lot of people who fall in the battles and the wars. And it's interesting to see who's left standing at the end, and why, and what it means. Yeah. Uh, look forward to my overall summary of this series coming soon. I'm gonna go over the various themes of the soul companions and just the magic use in general, like the Devon Monk system for magic, and a few other things in a culmination video after we do the book review for book nine. So that'll probably be tomorrow night when all is said and done. But uh, if you've read this book, what did you think? Uh, how did you think uh, Tarek and Shame's dealings with Jingo Jingo went down. Uh, do you think it was done effectively or or well? Or do you think there was another way of going about it that would have been more effective? And of course in general, just by all means, please post a comment if you have any questions or your own opinions of this book. I would like to continue the conversation with you all. Uh, if you want to know more about this book and the overall series, go to devonmonk.com. She has pages for each book in the series with e come on now. You got each book in the series with excerpts. So if you want a little more than just a page and a paragraph. And she also has links to where you can purchase a copy of your very own online. Or you can go to your local book repository of choice be it a brick and mortar store or your local library, whatever you prefer. But as if I've said it again before, I'll say it again, buy the whole series, it's worth it. All right, tune in tomorrow for the review of book nine, which is Magic for a Price. We're almost done with this series, guys. See you tomorrow.